Good morning, family, friends, believers, and unbelievers alike. It's Super Sunday. Sunday! And we're grateful once again for the Lord allowing us and using us to bring his lesson on this week of March 12, 2023. And the title of our lesson is Overcoming Temptation with the Word. With the Word. And it's coming from Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 14a. So it's going to be a lot of reading. Let you know, it's going to be a lot of reading. So we're going to say a quick prayer. Then we're going to read the scripture. And then we're going to jump into this lesson. Our Holy Father, God that is in heaven. Thank you once again for another blessing, Lord God. For allowing us to see on the day, Lord. Thank you for waking us up, Father God. In our right minds, Father God. Pray that our hearts and minds are focused on you now, Lord. Use us, Father God, as instruments, Lord God. I pray that we, we won't get the glory, but you get the glory. I pray that people won't see us, but your Holy Spirit, Father God, that lives in us. God, we thank you for your truth, Father God. We thank you for your life-changing, Father God, message. Now use it, Father God, to change a life. <coughs> we pray and ask this in your son Jesus' name, under your authority and power, God. Amen. Amen. Would you like to read first? Yes. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you <clears throat> sorry, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor all this i will give you he said if you will bow down and worship me jesus said to him away from me satan for it is written worship the lord your god and serve him only then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him when jesus heard that john had been put in prison he withdrew to galilee leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Thank you. You know how we do it? We break it down into two halves. I have the first half. My wife has the second half. So as I said, a lot of reading. So it's from verse 1 through verse 14. Hey, so I got from verse 1 through verse 7, and my wife can continue verse 8 through verse 14. Hey. Um, as I studied the lesson, Holy Spirit. Give me two words uh, concerning um, our lesson. The two words are preparation and test. So if you haven't been to school or have taken a driving test, you know you have, to, you have to prepare for it to take the test and to pass mm -hmm. the test. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna give you the two definitions for these two words. Preparation. The act 
or process of making something ready for use or service or of getting ready for some occasion, test or duty. Test. A procedure intended to establish um, the quality, performance or reliability of something, especially before it is um, before it is taken into widespread use. <clears throat> so we're gonna open with an excerpt from the expository concerning preparation and tests. And it reads as follows. New products usually undergo rigorous testing before being introduced to the market. A product that cannot endure severe testing in the laboratory, um, in the laboratory cannot be expected to do well in real life situations. A visitor to a testing laboratory might think that good item or um excuse me a visitor to a testing laboratory might think that good items are being unnecessarily abused in reality the abuse of the product is not meant to destroy it but to prove its worthiness and here in matthew we have jesus our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer, being tested. But this uh, test was a preparation for its um, ultimate test. And as Bible scholars, if you read the Bible, you know what the ultimate test is. And I will touch on that as we go through the lesson. So... I'm going to read for context. Um, I have this broken down into three sections. So my first section, it covers verse 1 through verse 2. And I'm reading for New Living Translation, um, the verses. And it reads as follows. Then Jesus went, excuse me. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. Wait a minute. Um, when we think of the Holy Spirit, we think the Holy Spirit leads us to good things. Here, in this verse is telling us the Holy Spirit led Jesus in the wilderness to be tempted. Something bad, right? Sometimes we feel that if the Holy Spirit leads us, it will be for the good. But that's not necessarily true. We read in Deuteronomy 8 and 2 that God led Israel into the wilderness to be humble and to test them. A person cannot exhibit true obedience if he or she um, has, has uh, excuse me, has uh, ever had an opportunity to disobey. So you can't have true obedience if you didn't have, if you didn't have an opportunity to disobey. So you have to have that uh, opportunity to say if I'm going to really go against what I believe or am I going to not. So the opportunity, if you have the opportunity to do bad, then you don't know how to do good if you're not able to do bad. God wants to see um, whether or not his people will really obey him. So that's why we get tempted. We get tested in the life. We go through trials and tribulations. Say, if this trial or tribulation is going to break us, if this temptation is going to break us and um, take us away um, from trusting and obeying God. We may um, ask ourselves, why was Jesus tempted? 
right? Temptation is part of human experience. It's part of the human experience. Jesus was fully human. For him to understand us, um, he had to undergo temptation. Um, so, Jesus was fully human and fully God. But he came to reconcile us back to the Father. So he was fully human. So he had to understand how, I mean, how we experience things. So he was tempted. <coughs> He's human. His humanness, his human side was here tempted by Satan um, to see if he's going to disobey God, if he can withstand um, the pressure um, of what he um, uh, went through. And also, he was tempted because in the beginning when God created everything, he created everything perfect. He created a being perfect. So because Adam messed it up, Jesus had Jesus had to come to undo all that Adam did. So this is another opportunity for Satan to see if he's gonna win and take um another being that got created away from God. Adam and Eve, they sin, so that separated them from separated them from God because they became they knew um the knowledge of uh, good and evil and they disobeyed God. So that broke their perfect standing with God. Hebrews um uh four And 15 says this. Let's see if they, 4 and 15 says this. I'm going to read it from the easy. It says this. Bear with me. Jesus, our great priest, I mean, understands us. He knows how weak we are. He knows that we sometimes want to do um, uh, wrong things. The devil tried to make him do all those same kind of wrong things, but Jesus never did anything wrong, meaning Jesus never um, sinned. So, it's just to encourage us that this is what Jesus went through. Same temptations and things that we go through that the enemy throws at us. But he used the word of God to resist. He didn't sin with all the temptations that came. So it's just giving us um, encouragement that we can do that also. We can be encouraged knowing that Jesus face temptations without giving in to sin. Um, he is an example to us when we face the alluring pull of temptation. So be encouraged that the Savior, the Redeemer, he went through the same things we go through. <clears throat> and he came through it uh, without giving in um, to that temptation. Like I mentioned before that Deuteronomy talks about um, how God led the Israelites into the wilderness to be tested. So we know that it's not always a bad thing when we get tempted. It just shows and it builds um, our character. So I'm going to go to that Deuteronomy verse. Eight uh, verses three and two. I'm going to read it from the amp, and it reads like this 
this this will transition us into um, verses three and four to the next um, section. And it reads as follows. And you shall remember always all the ways which the Lord your God has led you these 40 days in the wilderness so that he might humble you and test you to know what to know what was in your heart and your mind. Um, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Three says, he humbled you and allowed you um, to be hungry and fed you with manna, a substance which you did not know, nor did your fathers um, know, so that he might make you under might make you understand by personal experience that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And that transitions us into verses uh, three and four. And let's get a brief context. Verse 3. Du during that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scripture says, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Because God will judge us on what um, kind of worker uh, we have been for him. We should build our lives on his word and build his word into our life. Second Timothy 2 and 15 um, uh, states it like this. It says, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. God's word alone tells us how um, to live for and serve him. So the word it's not about eating food that sustains us. We were born, reborn when we give our lives to Christ. So now the word is our food that builds our spirit our spirit. So it's not that we eat and that's it. We have to feed on the word of God also. Ephesians 6, um, 17 tells us that God's word is a sword um, we should carry daily. Because this is what Jesus did in the wilderness. He used the word of God to resist the devil. So use this, the, the word is in the Bible, I mean, in Ephesians, is called a sword. So you use it to battle um, against all the spiritual attacks that come against us. You use God's word. Excuse me. Knowing the word of God is important. It helps us resist the devil's attack. But obeying it makes all the difference. That's the difference with... Um, that when, when the devil quoted scripture to him, that's a difference. He knew the scripture because he was an angel. He knew God created him. He know God. He knows God's word. But the difference <clears throat> is he doesn't obey God's word, but Jesus does, and we should all we should do we should we should too also. And now, um, transitioning into my two last verses, uh, verses. I mean, not two last verses, but. Three verses, five through seven. Uh, 
And it reads as this. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the high, highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures, scriptures say, He will um, order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Verse 7, Jesus um, responded, The scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord, your God. Note here, like I was saying before, note here that Satan also memorized and knows scripture, mm -hmm. but he failed to obey it. Mm -hmm. Hence, that's why he's here ruling. His, this is his domain. Mm -hmm. Hence, that's why God kicked him out of heaven because he did not obey God. Mm -hmm. He did not obey God's word. The devil used the word of God. Hear me. Here. Listen to me here. Here, here. Listen to this. Holy Spirit gave me this. The devil used the word of God to try to convince the Son of God to sin. Hear me again. The devil tried to use the word of God um, to try to convince the Son of God um, to sin. That means he tr that means he tried to use the word to convince the word to sin. John 1 says in the beginning was the word and the word, word was with God and the word was God. So Jesus Christ is the word of God. So he tried to use the word of God to convince the word of God to sin Jesus Christ. Y'all get that when y'all go. The world will present attractive and convincing reasons why we should try something we know is wrong. They might even use Bible verses that seem to support their point of views. Mm. This is why it's so important to stay in communication with God mm -hmm. through his word in prayer and my last uh, statement because we never and, and, and why is it important because we never know when it's our time to be tested take it, take it on okay. take it on to the finish line okay So I'm going to read my first um, <clears throat> verses 8 through 11, and then I'll read, um, and then I'll speak on that, and then I'll finish 12 through, through 14. <clears throat> Verse 8, again, the devil took him to the very, to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended to him. Amen. <clears throat> Every day, um, I'm reading the introduction to the opening segment of my section of lesson today every day that we live we are tempted to sin for all from all directions sin attacks us mm -hmm. when jesus lived on earth he also had to face temptations even before he began his public ministry jesus was tempted by satan as satan tried to undermine god's program of salvation he tempted jesus to use his divine power independently of god's will he also tried to get Jesus to reveal himself by performing in, in, an impressive feat rather than by following the Father's plan. Furthermore, he sought to get Jesus to grasp for authority without going to the cross. The, this incident was not the only episode of temptation that Jesus faced. Throughout his three-year earthly ministry, 
Jesus had to resist the attacks of Satan in many forms. He had to put the will of God ahead of his own comfort. As Jesus resisted each of these temptations, he kept his focus on doing what he had came to earth to do. Okay. As we read, <clears throat> Jesus' temptations, there were three um, ways that Jesus was tested. He was tested in his pride. He was tested through the flesh and he was tested. He was, I'm sorry, he was tempted pride um, with pride. He was tempted with the flesh and he was tempted with ambition. The word of God is our best defense against temptation. We too can overcome temptation as Jesus did. We should take two main thoughts from Jesus's temptation. First, the temptation was real. Jesus could have done any or all of the things Satan suggested and the things Satan offered to give in exchange where he where, uh, were by his right. Satan's temptations was skillfully targeted. The same propositions presented to us would have been less fatal to God's plan. And second, I'm reading from the expository. Second extreme conditions provided a stern test of character. Believers who are near death have been known to struggle as their flesh asserts itself in spite of a life of Christian service. Jesus must have been near death after 40 days, mm -hmm. after the 40 day fast. Notice though, that the scriptures provided an answer at each point of temptation and that his dependence on them surfaced as a time of deep need, at a time of deep need. Like a distance runner, he was conditioned for an extreme endurance test. Mm. We do not know when tests will occur, but we are responsible for being prepared. Amen. The first two tests were subtle was subtle attempts to get Jesus to work outside the plan of God. The final test was more blatant was a more blatant temptation. Jesus knew that the earth rightfully belonged to him and that he would eventually reign as king over it all. Nevertheless, before he could rule over the earth, Jesus had to redeem the earth for, from its sins. He had to come to earth as a man so that he could be God's substitute for sinful humans on the cross. Before Jesus could wear the crown, he had to endure the cross. Satan was saying that Jesus could be king without having to go to the cross. By grabbing the crown for himself, Jesus would have forfeited salvation for humans. Only God could give authority over the earth. And he <clears throat> would one day give it to Jesus. Instead of thinking that the end would justify the means, as we frequently are tempted to do, Jesus fixed his focus on worshiping the Lord and obeying his word. No one else is to share the worship that belongs exclusively to God. The devil offered the whole world to Jesus if Jesus would only bow down and worship him. Today, the devil offers us the world by trying to entice us with pleasure, possessions, and power. We can resist temptations the same way Jesus did. If you find yourself craving something that the world offers, quote the words Jesus spoke to the devil. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus' authority over Satan was fully established and Satan left. Did the devil have the power to give Jesus the kingdoms of the world? Hmm. Didn't God, the creator of the world, have control over these nations? 
The devil was exaggerating his implied power. Or he may have based his offer on his temporary control or, and free reign over the earth because of humanity's sinfulness. He tempted Jesus to take over the whole world as a political ruler right then without carrying out his plan to save the world from sin by dying on the cross for us. For all Jerusalem to see, Jesus gliding down with angels all around him would have been spectacular. And to do so would have seemed to fulfill what prophets predicted and what the people wanted. But Jesus knew that this was not God's plan. It could never be God's plan for Jesus to fulfill a prophecy at Satan's bidding. Satan was tempting Jesus to take over his earthly kingdom in an act of power instead of going humbly to the cross for us. <clears throat> Jesus passed the test successfully. Rather than yield to temptation, he stood in obedience to the word and will of God. It is likely when the angels came and ministered to Jesus, they provided food to nourish him physically and fellowship to encourage him emotionally. We may learn from the angels' ministry that God provides extraordinary grace for those who are required to endure extraordinary things for him. Okay. Angels like these who waited on Jesus have a significant role as God's messengers. These spiritual beings were involved in Jesus' life on earth by one, announcing Jesus' birth to Mary, two, reassuring Joseph, three, naming Jesus, four, announcing Jesus' birth to the shepherds, five, protecting Jesus by sending his family to Egypt, and six, ministering to Jesus in Gethsemane. So now I'm going to read verses 12 through 14. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Gonna read from the expository. Mm -hmm. The ministry of John the Baptist was centered in Judea. That part of the country was the heart of Jewish life. So it was where people would expect prophets to minister. Jesus, however, um, did not fit the typical pattern. His ministry was to have a different geographical focus. When John, with John, unable to continue his public ministry, it seems the Jewish religious leaders headquartered in Jerusalem turned their attention to Jesus. Sensing it was not the time to engage this opposition Jesus left Judea and traveled north to the province of Galilee. There, he began his great Galilean ministry of teaching, preaching, and healing. John's ministry was concluding, and Jesus' public ministry was just now beginning. Jesus knew that faithfulness to God's calling cost John freedom and eventually resulted in his death. Jesus' temptations not only serve as a major prelude to his ministry, they also reveal Jesus' approach to ministry. Jesus' goal was to focus on God and God's truth. People were created by God to worship him, yet many people throughout the world worship other gods. Jesus, however, came to redirect our worship to the one true and living God. Although Jesus had lived in um, 
had lived for many years in Nazareth, he did not choose to make his hometown his basis, his base of operation. In the time of Jesus, Galilee was a vibrant commercial area. Several major roads crossed the region, so it saw a continual flow of people from throughout the Mediterranean world. Although Galileans were often ridiculed by the people of Judea, in reality, they were much more involved in the international life than the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Galilee was thus an ideal location for Jesus to proclaim the good news. Jesus was tested comprehensively, but was victorious every over every temptation that was presented to him. Temptation is real for all of us. In fact, we are tempted in the same basic areas as Jesus was. We can be thankful for the example of victory Jesus set. Jesus' experience demonstrates how important it is to learn the scriptures. And just want to end with saying that this is why in the Bible it tells us to meditate day and night on God's word and to hide God's word in our heart. And the Holy Spirit will recall scripture to us in times of temptation in times where we need to obey God's word mm -hmm. and disconnect from the world. So I hope that you were blessed from this lesson. Mm -hmm. I hope that we were able to, through the Holy Spirit, to give you insight on how to flee from temptation and how to resist the devil by using the word of God. Amen. Love you. Peace. Peace.